there we go what do you think huh background for the day that's in it um so i knew today um that i obviously i knew i had justin barrett on today so i was thinking I was, he's obviously going to be um he's always going to make my clothes look ridiculous he'll be wearing a suit he'll be wearing a tie so i changed my white t-shirt to a black t-shirt so i look a little tidier underneath the hoodie but um other than that that's all i managed but what i have noticed is friendly ghost you're not being friendly again i don't know about this name of yours a crooked politician i don't you're american i think aren't you you don't even know who he is um but uh, other than that come as the time you did we well we were a bit late good news da, 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 da. okay so he's actually here waiting he's ready to go i didn't get a chance to talk to him before the stream so this will be my first time talking to him uh, I've been excited about it. I've been deep diving on um, uh, on a few few live streams that he's been in before and trying to figure out what I want to talk to him about and how best to take the interview. But uh, it should be a lot of fun. So I'll just get him in straight away because that's what everyone's here for anyway. So, Justin, how are you? Hello. How are you? Um, what Good. should I call you? Baron? <laughs> or, or his lordship? <laughs> <laughs> Either of them is fine. Um, Either is that, of them is, is fine. Grand, grand. Um, okay. Um, unfortunately, I haven't worn a suit. Um, made, made the weather being what it is, so I've I've dressed down. Which uh, shirt and tie for me is practically wearing pajamas. So I apologise to the <laughs> audience for a, for, for um, a low caliber presentation uh, uh, dress wise. Um, but maybe we'll make up for it in in, in what we have to say during the yeah. um, during the short while that we have. Yeah. Okay. I see you have Patrick Pierce on the like wall behind you. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, he's there all the time. He's not just up there for broadcasts or anything. He's behind my desk at, <laughs> at all times, watching everything I do. Um, and I hope not too disparagingly, not, um, not with any, um, you know, a sense of oh my god, like um, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> Oh my God, I wouldn't have done that. Or what the hell is he at? Is this Irish nationalism in 2023? No, I would hope that um, that he would, uh, if if he is aware of what we are doing in the country at the moment, that he looks kindly uh, upon our efforts uh, in the National Party and in the dissident, shall we call it the dissident right movement in general, uh, certainly the dissident movement, because the government we have now is unquestionably as un-Irish a government as it was in the days when he was planning the rebellion, when he was planning the rising. And in a certain sense, we can't use the same methods. Uh, the same methods are not appropriate to our day, but we have the same problems um, in many ways. We have a... They had an Anglicization of society. We have a globalization of society. And, and because we live in the Anglosphere, a globalization of society in practical terms means we've been re Anglicized again. And of course, um, added to that, we've been diversified uh, into a mishmash uh, at this point of. People who are clearly not Irish, that's certainly the case, uh, but also are not, it's not possible for them to ever be Irish. It's not possible for them to ever assimilate into this country. It's not possible for them to ever be part of our nation, our culture, or our future. And as such, um, we have a task, and we have a task which is to regain Irish freedom and to regain Irish sovereignty and to break that connection with globalism, I guess, uh, that all-encompassing, that all-pervading, uh, that, that, that suffocating pressure that's upon everybody's daily lives now as a result of the globalization process, uh, whether it be expressed through specifically the immigration issue or whether it be expressed through the uh, what is being taught in our schools, what is being displayed in our libraries, uh, how our uh, on Garda Shia Kona, uh, I took a 
weird solace, weird solace, really, uh, when you think the former your RUC, the PS and I, uh, refused to take part in the Pride Parade in uniform in the occupied six counties. But down here, uh, Garda cars are festooned with the flag of globalism. I, I think it's ceased, the rainbow flag has ceased even to represent homosexuality or gays or anything like that. It's, it's merely incidental that, that that's its origin. Uh, when I see the flag of that, that was the gay flag, as it were, uh, what, which then became the LGBTQWXYZ flag, what I see is, is uh, the modern equivalent, the 2023 equivalent of the Union Jack. I see the flag of occupation. And it's, mm -hmm. it's above our schools, it's above our guard stations, it's above our public buildings. And sometimes uh, it is there in the complete absence of the tricolor. Uh, quite often, indeed, it's in the complete absence of the tricolor. Now, I, emotionally, I'm, I'm kind of happy about that. Uh, why, either the tricolor goes up by itself or uh, the flag of globalism comes down. Um, uh, they can they shouldn't bo both fly together. But obviously, the National Party, myself, uh, uh, has uh, preferences too soft a word. A demand that the only flag that should fly over public buildings in Ireland are is the flag of the Irish Republic, and perhaps a the flag of a foreign nation when there is a visiting dignitary or something like that but never ever ever uh the the six colored rainbow of globalization and dominance never mind the various things they've added on to it i mean i know some of them refer to race the brown uh, color and the black color and so on and so forth I'm, i i don't know and maybe you for me here um because somebody was asking me the other day and i went do you know i haven't looked i i, I haven't looked into it but what does the circle mean does anybody know what oh. the circle is for maybe the chat could tell us i have no idea i kind of keep my um yeah i keep my att my attention away from all of that stuff so I, I i would literally have no idea what's going on in the lcd tv community right at all. okay um <laughs> well, but, neither do I as such, but um, uh, yeah, the circle. Can anyone tell us what the, what the, the circle is? I don't know what it means. No idea. <laughs> so, um, just so, so everybody um, knows, there's 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 quite a lag um, because of um, Justin's internet, and I, I saw that before on Keith Wood's stream, which I watched about three times today, getting ready for this stream, but. Um, so just so everyone knows, if we seem to be talking over each other, it's just that, and it's every now and again, I'll be mindful of it, and it won't happen too often. But um, one thing I did want to point out is that um, quite a, quite a, just because of the corner of the internet that I've sort of, my channel emerged from, about well over 50%, I'd say, of my viewers are Americans, and, and a good few of them are Irish Americans. So it's a good topic, because I, I, I saw in the Keith stream today, you have come to a, a conclusion that I came to myself as well, but the, the strong conclusion about how we need to change our attitude towards Irish Americans as Irish nationalists. Um, and that's something I'd love to hear you talk on now. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very much our opinion. Um, there, there is a hashtag that's been running for some time on, on the internet uh, and, and Twitter, like obviously, uh, Ireland is full. And what the people who have put up the hashtag means, of course, is the hospital system is overrun, the, the housing is overrun and various things like that. And the response always from the liberals is that the population density is not as great as it was in the 1840s and therefore it is not objectively full. Well, yeah, it is not full um, in that sense. The system is overloaded, but the country is not full. So if the question is, can we take uh, more people? Um, in the first instance, well, we could make more people. And um, there is no need to go into any great detail as to how that's done. Um, <laughs> it's not done with an LGBT flag, mind you, but there you go. Um, the, uh, the first place 
if there is a need to replenish the Irish population, with, uh, which is aging uh, at the moment, uh, for pension purposes and other purposes, uh, with a young, uh, young workforce that is not yet born and is not yet coming on stream into the workforce in their like late teens, early 20s, uh, mid 20s, 30s, whatever, is uh, the obvious place to look. The obvious place to look is to the diaspora, to Irish Americans, to Irish Australians, Irish Canadians, for those people for whom we are the motherland. We are here on this island, the, their ancestral home. A, uh, they've made a home for themselves. They made a life for themselves abroad in countries that, let's face it, like they're no more than ourselves in many ways, but like they're falling apart. And uh, in Canada in particular is falling apart at, a, at, at a, a very rapid rate. So the National Party has a policy of um, that the Irish nation should be a sanctuary for Irish people from all over the world. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, the entire Irish American population could come back in one day. Uh, but in practical terms, that's not what's going to happen. But what we should do is, if the argument is, and the argument is made, is that there, the economy needs youth, youthful workers, and we need immigrants for that purpose, then the first and foremost place we should look to is to people of Irish blood who have gone abroad. Uh, and in particular, that means Irish Americans, first generation, second generation, third generation. I'm not really concerned on how, how far back that goes, uh, so long as the focus is on bringing our people home. Uh, rather than bringing in people who are fundamentally hostile to the Irish way of living and fundamentally hostile to the Irish culture and 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 will inevitably undermine it. Even those who are not actively hostile must, by their nature, uh, be under an undermining influence because they are foreign. That's, that, that is in, in and of itself. Whereas the assimilation of Irish Americans, particularly those who have maintained the culture um, in, in the United States of Irish music and Irish uh, habit and, 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 and intermarriage, indeed, um, they are the first place, obviously, to look for. And, and our connection with those people is a blood connection, and it's a, it's a blood and soil connection. And they should be top of the list if we're talking about bringing uh, people in or talking about the fact that the population density uh, is, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is Ireland has room for more people, but it doesn't have room for more foreigners. Yeah, on that note, actually, that's something that struck me that I found out only lately. I was, you know, there's an Irish form of martial arts involving using a walking stick almost. It's I can't, it's not a walking stick, but it's the it's the heavy stick cane with a with a knotted end that people used to use as walking sticks. Um, so it's an it's an old form I... of martial art, and that that's all but dead here. But the only place where you can still get original tutelage in this martial art is in Canada and in northern United States. From right, that's that's extremely interesting. Well, that means that uh, you know what you're essentially. And I'm not familiar with it myself, uh, so I don't know a hell of a lot about mm -hmm. it. But it would suggest, and 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 there's numerous other things that would suggest as well, is that Irish Americans, Irish Canadians, Irish Australians, people, I, uh, the the diaspora abroad has kept alive some of the aspects of Irish culture that we have actually lost here. And mm -hmm. that would that would be an example. Um, only one, I would imagine, but definitely that would be an example. And very interesting to, to, to note that there is such a, a movement or a, a grouping uh, in, in the United States and Canada and elsewhere. Okay. Yeah, no, when I found that, I was, I was yeah, I thought it was amazing. And one of the things that I got from um, <clears throat> listening to Keith and yourself talking multiple times today was, uh, for me, it was very interesting in terms of, it was almost, uh, 
not an education, but it certainly opened my eyes to a more nuanced and more flavored view of sort of the Irish struggle for independence. When you talk about it, you 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 give the characters that in that I learned about in school just with dates and times and and acts that they were involved with. But when you talk about it, it feels more flavorsome. And I started getting into these characters, right, a little bit more. But um, one thing I felt from you is that I, uh, is that I almost think. Now I don't want to. I don't want to, to um, act as if you're being prideful or anything. But do you do you see yourself as being a, a part of this continuing story with these people that you're so interested in? I would say that I'm trying to be, and I think uh, that's something that every member of the National Party aspires to be, uh, uh, to be the con continuation of the tradition of Irish nationalism into modern times and to pass on that tradition. I have children myself and I, try and, uh, I, I certainly intend to, to pass that on to them. So I don't think it's a prideful thing uh, to say that we, we we try and emulate or we try and follow in the tradition of Irish nationalists in the past. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a focus on, say, 1916, the War of Independence, because of the centenaries are coming around now in particular. But much further back than that, um, the, the, the Irish struggle for freedom uh, essentially began with... Uh, I guess uh, the arrival of the, in historical terms, the arrival uh, of the Normans in 1169, uh, or is it 1189? Um, I'm open to correction there, but if you're going back a thousand years, man, perhaps people will allow me a 20 year error. Um, <coughs> the, the battle has been long and the battle has been continuous and it has gone from generation to generation. And it is something that uh, my wife tells me in particular is uh, I'll talk about something that happened in 1746 with the same. And if it's in the negative, it, I will I will talk about it with the same venom as if it happened yesterday. And it happened to me personally. <laughs> I don't um, I very much engage with these historical characters as real people with with real worries real concerns with real um you know for example when we look at the courageous deeds that these men can, like were engaged in it seems they're almost superhuman and it seems almost well we can we could never aspire to to the courage that they had, or we could never aspire to the deeds that they did. But in reality, they had the same worries and they had the same concerns as ourselves. They had families, they had, they were married, they had children, they had, uh, they had responsibilities, they had uh, people to, 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 that they needed to look after and, 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 and take care of and so on and so forth. So they lived, they lived lives, they lived lives as human beings do. Uh, and yet, they had this capacity. They were real human flesh and blood. They were not, they were not spirits. They were not, and they are not spirits to me now either. They are historical characters who really lived, who were really mm -hmm. alive, just the same as you and I are now. And they face certain choices in their lives. And time and time again, when fear might have advise them to go a softer path. The people that we revere today are the people who took the harder path uh, and took the more courageous path and took the more idealistic path. So when one is confronted, uh, uh, and, and usually people are today, uh, with family members, for example, saying, you're, you're, you're an idiot, uh, what's got you? You could be making more money. Um, you could you could you could be risking your job doing what you're doing and being involved in Irish nationalism. You could be risking your career and so forth. Well, all of this happened before. But I will tell you one thing is that the family members are or even the friends and acquaintances that say these things to you, even well-meaning people who do so, is they come and go and they're forgotten. History will forget them. 
Um, mm-hmm. they will they they will leave no memory beyond this their second generation. Uh, Porrick Pierce, for example, had no children of his own. He was unmarried. He had no children of his own. Uh, but his name will be remembered a hundred years from now, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred years from now. We remember the names of the great O'Neill. We remember the names of Owen Rowe O'Neill. We remember the names of Robert Emmett. We remember, and Robert Emmett could not be in many ways more of a practical materialistic failure in life and yet the 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 sheer dignity and magnitude of what he did for ireland means that he is forever burnt into the consciousness or should forever at least be burnt into the consciousness of every irish nationalist to emulate uh, and to perhaps be more successful, yes, yeah, that's true. But uh, but he was a real man with real fears and real concerns and real worries and real things to lose. And indeed, uh, while lost all of them, all of them indeed on the gallows and knew he was going to lose all of them on the gallows and met even the court, his court case with the famous oration from there which I recommend to anybody to read uh, and read it read it as if you're reading it now but don't read it as a historical document from you know 200 years ago read it as he said it uh, because he was standing in a court whom he knew that if he begged the favor of the court and he apologized and he said like uh, you know uh, I was wrong I made a mistake I was rash I was a young man whatever uh, he might have got a, a hefty prison sentence but because he was so defiant he knew he was facing the gallows he knew he was facing the hangman's noose and for Ireland uh, he didn't care for himself I'm sure he did very much so uh, because as I say real human beings have real fears and real terrors about um, hangman's nooses. <laughs> there are there. There's very few things that concentrate the mind, like the knowledge that that you're, you're facing the gallows in the morning. But he rose above that, and and every person can rise above their 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 base level to become. Everybody's a potential hero, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Now, whether you realize that potential or not in your own life, it depends on you. You're writing your own biography every day that you get mm-hmm. up in the morning and what you do, what you say, who you meet, what uh, and overall, you're writing your own biography. When historians come back and look at it, either they will go, oh, well, that, that was an uninteresting life and it's, a, it's of no consequence. Or they will read the history of your life and go, yes, this is this is every detail of this is of interest uh, because of what you have achieved subsequently. So. I would say to people, even if they have not been involved in nationalist politics before and and they have never done anything before, no matter what age you are, is that the last chapter, even if you're at a very advanced age, the last chapters of your biography are yet to be written. And you get to write them. You get to write them uh, by what you do. And everybody is capable everybody is capable of the courage that our historical ancestors uh, gave. Uh, so it's not prideful for me to say it, a, a, that that I see myself and I see the National Party and I see the members of the National Party following that tradition. I see it as a great weight and a great burden to live up to that and to not shame them by a miserable uh, effort or a miserable display in in our generation, because I would say my generation. Now I'm like in my early fifties. My generation, in general, has nothing to be proud of. It let this country go to hell in a handcart, literally, and it took the inheritance it had been given, and it threw it away, and. Sometimes I see uh, people again in social media and elsewhere saying, "Well, if only it could be that, that, like, like it was in the 1990s." And I'm going, well, "I was there. I was there. It wasn't that uh, great? This Italian 90 style nationalism is not good enough. 
uh, what's called. I don't want to go back to extra vision. Uh, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine with streaming <laughs> movies. I'm fine with technology. I'm fine with that. That's not the problem here. Um, I don't want to go back in time. I don't want to go back to the 90s. I don't want to go back to the 80s. And I certainly don't want to go back to the 1950s. When I see footage from back then, I look at it and I go, oh, my God, that just seems like a terrible place to live. No, I don't know. I wasn't there, so I don't know. But, um, but I don't hark back, and the National Party do not hark back to another age or another time for its inspiration Yes, perhaps, but not to another time to replicate, but rather to carry forward into the future. Let's have a let's have a 2023 nationalism that can stand beside a 1916 nationalism, that can stand beside a 7998 nationalism, that can stand beside a 1690 nationalism and not be embarrassed. Let's have a 2024 nationalism, 25, 26, 27, and in and onwards and upwards uh, at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, um, earlier today, something struck me about um, about the nature of nationalism. I wanted to get your opinion on this. There's um, People can see nationalism differently, and that hero worship that you kind of tipped on that we have for some of the men of the past, um, everybody has it, and, and people... people frame things to suit their own personal perspective a lot so today actually i got a text message from a friend of mine where he shared a picture of um parnell uh like a plaque of parnell and this guy would be he you know he's he's a he's a, he's an historian but he's very kind of left-leaning kind of liberal kind of guy right so he he said to me mm -hmm. uh Parnell, a great man. Um, polit uh, he um, he did everything he did despite being a Protestant. He didn't let um, he didn't let little differences and uh, sectarian divides get in the way. He wouldn't have any interest in any of these uh, petty petty things that divide people nowadays that people are obsessed with. And I was like, "You're making Parnell into a social justice warrior. This is the plan now. <laughs> like, what's going on here?" Yeah. Um... Again, Parnell is a controversial figure because, uh, of course, he engaged in parliamentary politics in Westminster. And for a lot of uh, re Republicans, that's, uh, that places him, him outside the pale. But what I would suggest about Parnell, and I have a great admiration for Parnell as well, um, I've, uh, insofar as I have been able to, I've studied his life and studied his motives. And in general, it seems to me his heart was always in the right place and he was, or, or mostly was in the right place insofar as any human being can be. And uh, a social justice warrior in the modern sense of the word, no, he most definitely was not. Uh, Parnell, I can say, it definitely was not woke. Right. He definitely was not woke. I would say uh, uh, to, to use our own parlance for that is I would say Parnell was based. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he was absolutely based. <laughs> and yeah, uh, uh, I would say not in spite of him being a Protestant. You know, Robert Emmett was a Protestant. Lord uh, Edward Fitzgerald was, was a Protestant. In fact, the whole Orange Order, and since we're so close to the July the 12th and all the rest of it, the Orange Order did not start in 1690. The Orange Order was created by British intelligence uh, during the, eight, the, the late 1700s, early 1800s, with the purpose of undermining Protestant support for Irish nationalism because it was growing. And, uh, and they were seeing these figures come forward, like Wolf Tone and, and Robert mm -hmm. Emmett, as they said, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, et cetera, et cetera, uh, key figures in the Irish nationalist movement who were Protestants. And it was uh, the British plan to sow the seeds of dissension, or religious dissension in particular, by setting up organizations like the Orange Order uh, to embed sectarianism. And mm -hmm. so I don't see... Uh, Parnell's Protestantism being the, uh, a political problem for me, and I don't, I don't, um, I don't even, I don't even take it as an issue. Uh, I wonder if 
I wonder if he played parliamentary politics a little bit too much, a little bit uh, too idealistically, and ultimately that it was built on sand. And of course, the sand gave way, way under him in the end. But but he's a figure to be admired. Uh, I think by any right thinking Irish nationalist, not perfect. There aren't any any of us perfect. And, and indeed, he's not perfect as a historical character either. But, uh, but to reinvent him as a social justice warrior is almost, I mean, daft. It's daft. It's it's just you know it's yeah it's purely I couldn't like believe it that nonsense. it was uh, but it, sorry I said I could I was saying I couldn't believe he was kind of twisting it to that to that angle and he said and many of our our great leaders were you know he just he kind of just went on a bit about how they didn't let little differences get in their way and it was all angled at this you know that if they were around today they'd be woke but um it just kind of surprised me when he when he tried to pull that maneuver I've just it just seems so it's, it's so outside of what's logically possible in any way that I, you know, and it, it made me think that we almost anybody who was raised like you mentioned the 90s. I was sort of raised in the 90s, almost um, born in the 80s. And uh, that time, things were still quite in one way or another, quite nationalistic back then, certainly in terms of the education and how we were given Irish history and so on. I imagine it was much more nationalistic back then. So most people my age or older would have an affinity for nationalism, even if they found themselves so drifting so far towards like a liberal globalism in every other way, they still have this kind of feeling towards nationalism that they can't quite get past, I think. Well, it certainly was something that in the education system of Ireland, and again, I went through it uh, earlier than you, uh, what, which presumably means that I went through it when it was better than you did in terms of <laughs> nationalism, uh, and in terms of in terms of Irish history being taught without this revisionist nonsense that Conor Cruz O'Brien, for example, uh, championed. Uh, there's a social justice warrior before his time, in case, in case you want to label somebody of that nature. Conor Cruz O'Brien, who, who, by the way, changed the Irish historical curriculum as the Minister for Education uh, for when he was in the Labour Party in, in the Republic uh, in the South, and then uh, went on to become a unionist in in uh, the six counties and ran for like as a candidate for unionist party there. You know, it was always it was always there. Um, the nationalism has within the education system gradually became debased over time and became revisionist and became let's look at it uh, from a kind of neutral point of view as if these were not our people that, that they did not fight for our people that they fought for people or they fought for ideologies or they fought for causes uh, which we ourselves as individuals should be neutral about and simply observe now I can do that if I'm if I read. Well, I can't actually. I was going to say I can if I read American history. I I can do that. I can't actually. I, if I read American history, I end up taking sides uh, <laughs> very quickly <laughs> at at some point, and then I get very annoyed at the the people on the other side. And I won't tell you which side of each conflict I was on because I don't want to upset any of your Irish American audience. Let's just <laughs> let let's just. We, we won't we won't mention the civil war so we say <laughs> but I will say exactly, this yeah. is I will say this is that these people fought for us because the generations unborn this is something that 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 uh, the uh, most uh, Irish nationalists were very aware of and were very conscious of their responsibilities to the generations yet unborn not the even just the generation in the womb which you know is just wholesale being murdered now by abortion not just that but the generation generation like generation after generation their great 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 grandchildren uh, and how they would live and so we have no right to be neutral 
uh, when they weren't neutral. They weren't neutral mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, about us. They were very much faithful to the idea of creating a nation, first of all, a free nation, second of all, a Gaelic nation. And uh, that we would inherit and that we would get to live in and that we would have a better life than they had because of what they did. And so that's a very deep debt that we owe these people. And so we cannot afford to, uh, or at least I believe, we cannot afford to approach these historical characters with this kind of neutral, laissez-faire attitude of, well, this happened and then this happened. As you said uh, earlier on, just remembering them in terms of times and dates and places and locations and so on and so forth. They are very much part of who we are. And they very much knew that they were, they were when they were doing what they were doing, they very much intended to be part of who we were who we are mm -hmm. what i see now is a what what i what can only be described as a time lag there's a there's an intergeneration and it's an intergeneration which has been raised in an education system which is actively hostile to nationalism of any kind indeed is actively hostile to any sense of decency, morality, and I don't mean this in a religious sense. I'm just talking about common human decency here. You know, the, the, how we treat each other, how we behave towards each other, and not in this social justice way, because it's all very well to talk about, oh, the whole, the whole of humanity. The fact of the matter is, is that nobody, it's a cop-out to say that I have compassion for the whole of humanity, because the compassion for the whole of humanity requires nothing of me. But compassion towards my neighbor and compassion towards my, na my community and compassion towards my parish and compassion towards um, the, my nation and my county and so on and so forth. All of these things require something of me and all of these things require something of you and all of these things require something of your listeners as well to do in practical terms. If you have compassion for your locality and your own people. Compassion for the world is very easy to just express as virtue signaling on Twitter or something like that, but mm -hmm. it doesn't impact uh, in practical terms. Take, for example, the migrant, uh, the DP centres, uh, the loudest people in support of the uh, mass immigration into Ireland are to be found in Dawkey and Fox Rock and in the posh leafy suburbs thereof. They are not to be found in the work working class areas where these actual DP centers are being placed. And again, it's very easy to be uh, uh, get all teary eyed and emotional over something that doesn't affect you. But when it comes down to a matter of practicalities, you have a right, indeed you have a duty to put your own family first, to put your own community first, to put your own nation first. And we shouldn't detach ourselves from that. And what I think about the educational system is there was a lag there uh, where this revisionist history of standing back from it and merely observing it as, as almost irrelevant events that occurred, that that time lag has created a kind of a section of the population which is denationalized. But that the young people coming up are educating themselves and they are becoming new nationalists, if you like. And it's not because they were they're, they're, it was written on a blackboard and it's not because it was uh, told to them from either the pulpit, because it used to be, indeed, uh, Catholicism and nationalism in, in Ireland are, are inseparable in many ways. Um, it was taught in society in general, it was it was commonly understood that that everybody had had a, some kind of a duty to the nation, even if that wasn't very clearly defined. The youth that are coming up, the youth that are in particular who are joining the National Party today, uh, they're like 16, 17, 18, uh, they're 19, into their early 20s. Uh, they have come to nationalism 
by their own devices, largely speaking. Now, as a party, we hope to inspire that and encourage that and, and, and further that. But the early recruits, certainly, of the National Party were, had all came to us as ready-made nationalists because they had studied their history. Uh, they, they had observed the decline of their country. They had, had observed what was their future if things continued to go on the path that they are clearly going on at the moment. And mm -hmm. in the first instance, they went, wait a minute, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to go on the path that is laid out for me. And second of all, then lies the question, well, what path will I go on? Like, what, 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 what would I want if I didn't want what there is? Well, a lot of those young people have come to the realization that nationalism is the future and that the ancient heroes of Ireland are the inspiration, not of some historical drama, but they are the inspiration and the path towards a future way of living and a future way of creating a national community again among Irish people, where we look after, first of all, ourselves, yeah, uh, before other people, but also really look after ourselves, as in each other. So mm -hmm. we do not espouse the ideology of individualism uh, and putting self and putting ego above everything else. We do not espouse the, the, idea, the economic ideology of capitalism. Nor do we espouse the idea of, um, you know, internationalism. And therefore, it is inconceivable to us in the National Party that we would have a, any truck with or any part of a Marxist uh, regime. And that's what Sinn Féin have become uh, in, in, in traipsing around looking for an ideology to replace nationalism and the concept of a national community and the concept of a people you okay. have been infiltrated to a lot to as an extent by marxists and they've been allowed themselves to be in, infiltrated by marxists and marxist ideas and so they are they have set out an alternative path and the alternative path is marxism so we have neoliberal capitalism on the one hand represented largely by the current administration uh, and we have a Marxist alternative that is being presented to us in the form of Sinn Féin. We would reject both of those and I think instinctively the, the, uh, a large part of the youth that is growing up in this country right now that is coming of age as it were is rejecting both of those paths and of course <laughs> A Sinn Féin government will, will like, like nothing else, will disabuse people of the ideas uh, uh, that Marxism can, can, can work. It should or, or should work. It's an it's an immoral philosophy in and of itself. And even if it did work, it would be, still be wrong. But it doesn't work, mm -hmm. and we're going to find out in a very rough and tough way uh, in this country in the next few years just how badly it actually plays out in practice. So I'd be interested to know um, what your perspective, what your philosophy would be in terms of, um, like, could you paint a picture for somebody who's considering voting for the National Party of what what an Ir what a National Party-led Ireland might look like? What could be achieved? Well, first and foremost, we would we would. We would have that sense of national community. We would have that sense of that we were all in, in this together as Irish people. And that's why we would include those of the diaspora in Irish America and etc. as part of our extended family, if you like. And we would look on the nation, as, as Pori Pierce himself said, was uh, the nation is a family grown large. We have a responsibility to each other. We have a responsibility to take care of each other. So... When it comes to economics, for example, uh, what we have at the moment is a system where the uh, people are crushed under the weight of an economy that's crushed under the weight of capital. 
uh, people serve the economy and the economy serves capital. Now, it should be the other way around. Capital should serve the economy and the economy should serve the people. The most important thing in anybody's life is, generally speaking, I would say generally speaking, um, is not their job or their career. It is their family. It is our community and it is how they, they, they live together. And we need to recreate that sense of community. And it can be created around the ideology of nationalism, the idea that the reason why we are responsible for each other is that we are all Irish together. And that would be a, a philosophical start. Now, philosophy flows practicalities, practicalities to do with looking after our own which means the end of mass immigration and means the beginning of repatriation. It means putting Irish people first in every area of Irish life, in particular in housing, because we have this crisis in housing now. There are not enough houses in Ireland for the number of people in Ireland, and that goes back to the Ireland is full, the tr the tr to the extent to which the phrase Ireland is full is a true phrase, is... We do not have enough houses in Ireland for the number of people who are in Ireland. But we do have, what we do have, and it's really very, very simple. We have enough houses in Ireland for Irish people. And so if you remove the pressure of mass immigration, and if you remove the presence of mass immigration and the immigrants that, that that represent that, then we do not have a housing problem because it isn't a housing problem. We do not no. have an overburdened health service overburdened by Irish people. We have a, a health service that is overburdened by trying to take care of the entire world. We have 5.5, I just saw the figures the other day, 5.5 billion euro we will spend on Ukrainian refugees, just Ukrainian refugees next year. Now, that is an enormous sum of money, even in national exchequer terms. It's like 5.5 thousand million. Mm -hmm. And this is in a country that is some 245 billion in debt. We can find, again, the compassion for the whole world, but no compassion for our own people. Uh, yeah. We find we can find 5.5 billion for these people. We can find 6 billion uh, euro for uh, the non-governmental organizations, which are, are essentially subversive organizations uh, who are set at rotting the very core of the national psyche in the first instance and they and the the moral caliber of the nation they they, they are the spreaders of degeneracy is the only way to describe it it's, they are the spreaders of degeneracy and they are deliberately funded by the government with taxpayers money and then the government turns around and says well well we're only introducing such and such a policy because there is a great there is a huge public call for this new policy or this new bill or this new law like the anti-hate speech uh, law that's being there's no public pressure for it there's ngo pressure for it and the ngo pressure for it is funded by the government so this is a circular thing oh we have to do this because public opinion says we have to do this who represents public opinion the ngos who pays for the ngos the government Mm -hmm. And they, they, maybe that's the circle that I was referring to earlier on that I couldn't <laughs> fathom is on the, is on the, um, the, the um, LGBT flag. The circle of, first of all, we say put the, the government says the public want it and they, they, how do they know the public want it? Well, the NGOs tell them the public want it. And how do the NGOs know the public want it? Well, because they're paid by the government to go out and find people who say they want it. And, and so the circle, the circle of degeneracy closes and the circle of, and the circle and cycle of collapse closes. Another thing to, with regards to economics, outside the philosophy of economics, if you like, mm -hmm. is this is the excessive dependence on of Ireland on foreign direct investment. 
and foreign direct investment in Ireland is fine in and of itself if it's real. If it's if it's real factories, if it's real manufacturing, if it's real jobs, you don't have any difficulty with that, and I don't think anybody does. But when it's just the passage of money through Ireland through accounting practices for the purposes that uh, of avoiding tax in other countries, so we become a tax haven. That is an economy again uh, built on sand, because if the other countries either insist that that investment no longer passes through Ireland, or they insist, for example, which they could, that we raise our taxes um, rates uh, through the EU. Or alternatively, the United States, for example, where a lot of financial direct investment uh, into Ireland comes. Supposing the American government were in the morning, and this, is, this seems to me to be a simple thing uh, that they might do. Uh, Joe Biden won't do it because Joe Biden doesn't know who Joe Biden is. But um, <laughs> he... he, he a, a more uh, American government, a more um, uh, pro-American government might say, okay, X amount of your profits were supposedly taxed in Ireland and, um, and so forth, but that's not the end of your tax bill. Uh, uh, you owe uh, you owe taxes in the United States as well. You have to top it up to the United States level. You can't use Ireland as a tax tax haven anymore. And if they did that, the money would stop flowing through the Irish economy and therefore would stop flowing through the exchequer. And therefore, there wouldn't be the 5.5 billion for Ukrainian refugees. There wouldn't be the 5, 6 billion for the NGOs. There wouldn't be the money for all these various quangos and uh, woke notions. Uh, there wouldn't be the basics because we do not have a sound structural economy that makes stuff that people want to buy. That's the focus of economic development in the future, is to make things, create things that people actually want to buy and make them here using Irish workers or if we need so-called immigrant workers, let us take them from the diaspora, let, them, let, let our own come home. And so again, it's just a repetition of the same phrase, which is Irish people. Irish jobs for Irish people in an Irish economy built on Irish industry. That is crucial. That would, that's, that's absolutely crucial. And there isn't a single political party in this country who has developed or has even attempted to develop uh, a concept of what, how the economy should be run other than as a tax haven. And Sinn Féin, even with its Marxism, is only uh, intent on increasing the taxes so that we aren't a tax haven anymore. But they haven't explained where the, where the actual money is going to come from to run an economy once the tax haven status has gone. They have no domestic uh, economic plans to build up a native Irish economy. And it's essentially a hoax and it's essentially a trick. And it's essentially a gamble on um, getting into government, getting into uh, these so-called seats of power for whatever length of time they can manage to do that and hold on like the others. And what we will actually find in practice is, apart from a, a, a degree of change of rhetoric, what we will actually have is a government that behaves economically pretty much the same as the one now because it's directed by the EU to do so. We also need to reconnect with the concept and the idea of family values and a notion of having strong families that are supported by their community and by society in general, but also are not denigrated by the state. And, and Again, I know, as you say, this is not an issue that you specifically get into in any great detail, but the whole idea of Pride Month is, is, is an obnoxious concept to take a tiny minority of the country, uh, no matter what they are a tiny minority for. Uh, in this case, it's being degenerate, but <laughs> the tiny minority nonetheless, and giving an, over an entire month to how proud they are of being degenerate. Let's have a. Why don't? Why can't we have a family pride month? Uh, what's got? And we won't have. If you have a family pride month, by the way, we won't have um, half naked 
uh, men dancing in the street in front of children because that's <laughs> I can tell you as a family man myself that's not that's not family and that's not family pride and that's not what a family pride parade would look like um hmm. we need well, to just for the inevitable the, the, the foundation i was going to say just for the inevitable um, Sorry. that lag yeah that lag is funny you don't hear me until a few seconds after but uh just for the uh, the inevitable YouTube moderator who comes along, I just want to put up this little banner at the bottom now. I just want to say that this is the official stance. The LGBT community are amazing and brave. <laughs> okay, so let's just. Um, but, uh, I, I, um, they are ab they are absolutely amazing. They are absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yes, definitely. They are. Uh, I have a few. I have a few um, banners that I that, that that I can put up, at, you know, at, during times of need, you know. So they're always there, ready to go. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to say is, so first of all, anybody who got banned earlier by my son, um, that I've 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 gone and looked, and I can't see it. it must have just been timeouts. My wife sometimes lets my baby son look at the phone, look at my face when I'm streaming, and sometimes he bans people and times people out because he's mashing on the phone. <laughs> but, but that's that's what's been going on there yeah, no, anybody no. who's been back it's not because i didn't i did it on purpose um now that, sorry you were you were in the middle of something i wanted to just let you continue there can you remember or will i ask you that i'll ask you something else? Uh, I, uh, um sorry no uh I, I, you'll have to ask me in a, 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 yeah a that's question. absolutely fine yeah i can't yeah, I kind of um, I I just jumped right into the middle of the, your train. Um, one thing I was going to say about that is um, I just I put in the nine principles of the the National Party there into the into the chat for anybody who wants to look at it. I was trying to figure out how to pin them, but um, I, I I was reading through them today and I noticed number six, and this is something I was actually talking to one of my moderators about today, um, which is. The National Party believes in an aristocracy of achievement within a democracy of opportunity practiced and established economically by the strong advocacy of free productive enterprise. Consequently, we endorse the inalienable right of ownership of private property and shall defend that right against the equally dangerous encroachment of both state socialism and monopoly capitalism. Now, what does that mean in, in, in practice in terms of things like property tax, um, inheritance tax and so on and so forth what is the the stance of the national party on things like that right in practical terms uh, the property tax is fundamentally immoral uh, the idea that it's that a thing that has been worked for and paid for and bought with the earnings of work with the earnings mm -hmm. of effort uh, by by a person should be continuously taxed and 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 let's let's take the scenario forward for a moment because logically speaking if you either fail to pay that tax or you're unable to pay that tax at some point the state would have the right to confiscate that property because there would be so much tax owed on it that in fact it would actually belong to them and so your piece of private property would be taken off you despite the fact that you had paid for it. Again, mm -hmm. on the question of inheritance tax, I believe that when money, or, or more precisely, when any wealth, because again, you can get into the money question, which is so much more complicated, but mm -hmm. the when wealth is earned wealth, then it is what I, I would say sacrosanct. Uh, and therefore, it is only under the most, like even the, the idea that the government taxes um, anybody on their earnings is, is in and of itself a matter of necessity, not a matter of something that is a, a positive good in and of itself. Um, and to quote Thomas Jefferson, he governs best, who governs least. Um, that's applicable economically too. So, so if property is been paid for from money earned by honest work, 
and is being passed down from one generation to another. I do not see, we do not see the logic of the government being permitted to come in and say, no, we will take a third of that, or we will take, or, or we will take any significant amount of that. Because why? Because we can. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, because we can. Uh, that that to me is, but but the difference between that the national party would would be crucial on here, and this is why we use the term monopoly capitalism as well as state socialism, is uh, that we are equally opposed to, is the idea of unearned wealth, uh, capital accumula- accumulation, usury, interest, and so on and so uh-huh. forth. The current banking system, for example, quantitative easing, uh, the, the idea that the basement of the currency, uh, and so on and so forth, that these... There is a lot of very, very wealthy people in this country and around the world who have not done a tap of useful work or effort uh, in making billions and billions of euro. Um, Warren Buffett, for example, and and I give him as a, as a uh, before uh, the streamlines start coming in. He's like, oh, just embarrassed after mentioning a Jew. Uh, what's caught? Warren Buffett is not a Jew. Warren Buffett is not a Jew. Let's be clear about this. Yes, it just happens not to be a Jew. Um, but he has never done anything but invest. He has never done anything in his life but invest money. Uh, he has never, uh, he, he sits down and finds companies that are cheap to buy up on the stock market, whose value will go up over time. And he's become, he was at one point the richest man in the world. I think he's the third richest at the moment, not because he has gone down so much as the others have gone up even further. And he's created nothing. And he will admit that himself. He has created (laughs) absolutely nothing in his entire life. Now, that to me is unearned wealth. And that to me is, is a form of fraudulent wealth, it's speculative wealth, it's compounded interest wealth. And for what I would say about, say, Warren Buffett as a specific example, and I make a specific example because he's not one of them, uh, so that we don't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But he's every single dollar that he owns uh, ought to be confiscated by the United States government because not a single dollar has he earned by Mm -hmm. work or effort. Either he has contributed nothing to American society and those around him who have practiced the same kind of capitalist speculation whose religion we would just whatever it is um, it's not Protestant in general. Anyway, those people, uh, what's got two, then as far their 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 entire wealth is forfeit to the state, as far as I'm concerned. Uh forfeit to the federal government in the United States, forfeit to the state in Ireland. Unearned income must not be allowed to be the fundamental basis of a nation's economy. And that is exactly what. Monopoly capitalism in the West is now, is that economics, the whole structure of economics is based on unearned wealth and the repayment of interest by earned wealth in tribute to unearned wealth. And that is an absolutely disastrous scenario to find ourselves in. So uh, what we have is, is... is an economy, if you like, that is structured towards one person owning everything. And mathematically speaking, that's how it would work out eventually, is that one person would own absolutely everything in the world. So capitalism, if you like, a monopoly capitalism is that everything belongs to one person, ultimately. Communism, Marxism, on the other hand, theoretically at least, purports that everything, every uh, thing belongs to everybody. Now, mm-hmm. the National Party economic program, if, if you want to sum it up in a phrase, is to each his own. If you have earned it, then it's yours. And it's sacrosanct to you. 
and the property that you buy with earned wealth is sacrosanct to you and should not be taken off you by the government under any circumstances other than a national emergency, quite literally. Uh, mm -hmm. Private property is natural to man. Uh, it is inherent and it is not at odds but with the common good, by the way. The common good, um, private property is, and the possession of private property by a large section of the population is very much in keeping with the, the proper conception of the common good. So, yeah, that's, I, I, I think there I have covered, I mean, I could go through a few policy areas that we would prohibit abortion and we, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if, if you want to get a, I think I have advanced, I hope I have advanced a kind of a vision of the, or, or a notion of the kind of state we would live in if the National Party government were in in power in the morning the one we would create is one based on the concept of a national community of looking after each other of having private property yes of having free productive enterprise yes but getting rid of speculative capital and getting rid of the idea of state confiscation as well through marxism uh, that those two I economic ideas are dead and they are dead because they are destructive. They are fundamentally destructive of the common good and they are fundamentally destructive of humanity's very core. That we would found the nation on, on family first uh, and that family is uh, founded upon the marriage of one man with one woman and their children. That beyond that, uh, we would build a community and then we would build a nation and that nation would be as free as it possibly can be within the concept of cooperation with the other nations of the world because of course we're not going invading anybody but at the same time uh, uh, we don't want to be invaded i i think at all times nationalism is sometimes blamed for wars for example oh nationalism leads to hatred and hatred leads to uh, uh, wars and wars lead to except imperialism is what leads to wars the desire of one people to control another people the irish mm -hmm. people have never wanted to my knowledge and certainly the national party does not want to control any other people the Irish people do have never had that desire, never had that wish, and never um, engaged either on a governmental level or on a personal level in imperialist projects. That is where war comes from. When each respects, when, when each person in a community respects the property and the rights of other people in the community, that makes for uh, peace within a country. And what makes for peace within the world is not some humanitarian notion of oh, one, what we're all the what we're all the same and we're all one. What makes for peace in the world is respect for each other's differences and let each live their own lives in their own cultural circumstances in their own way. And uh, we need on an international level, we need an awful lot of minding of our own business. And, and, I, and I'm afraid to, I have to address your American audience here when I say that, is that the United States foreign policy, now that's not to blame the American people for it, but the United States foreign policy certainly since the early 1940s has been geared towards messing with everybody else and just refusing to mind its own business. And it's a disaster everywhere it's gone. And now the disaster is coming home to the United States. And I think without endorsing Donald Trump, the candidate or the person or the individual in any shape, fashion or form, I think he's let down an awful lot of people who believed in him. But Trumpism was about that notion of, look, we'll make America great, yes. Uh, what's got the main way in which we will do it is by minding our own business, uh, taking care of each other, and not and letting the rest of the world solve their problems in the way that they wish to solve their problems.
that's that's the way there's no there's no formula absolute formula for international peace but that's as close as it gets is everybody minds their own business so with this vision of ireland that you've kind of outlined now and um earlier you mentioned that we're not full um and but that there may be not even just space but actually a need for some high skill um input let's say some uh, some 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 high skilled um immigrants and that we should be focusing our preference towards the diaspora how would you propose attracting the diaspora home from this place that they've lived now some of them for hundreds of years um, how would you propose that well i think it would be more that we would create a right of return and uh, and once you've created a right of return then once you've created the conditions within the the, the country itself when, within ireland that make it an attractive place to be then the first people who will come home are the ones who left literally the the, the this generation the ones who left in their you know, early twenties, whatever. Yeah. So they they were born in Ireland. They lived. Here, they remember, and they didn't really want to go. They were they they went. Some of them may have gone for a little bit of experience of the world and the United States and you know and, and other Australia. countries as well to just the flavor. Yeah, the, the flavor of the world as it were. And there's no harm in that. A couple of years or a small uh, five or six years of your life, in, you know, traveling around. It's no harm in that. But they didn't fundamentally want to go forever. Uh, they were forced to go forever. And then they look back at the country that they left behind and they see nothing to come back to. We saw that um, graphically illustrated to us with the nurses that were on the steps of, of the uh, a building in Melbourne. And they had this huge banner uh, there about two, two or three years ago. And they, the banner read, uh, give us a reason to come home. And, um, you know, your your woke uh, internationalists will tell you, or oh, the Irish Health Service would fall apart if it wasn't for all the immigrants, if it wasn't for all the foreigners. But we have we have Irish nurses in Australia simply asking this, this, this very simple request, give us a reason to come home. Give us a health service uh, that we can work in. Give us campaign conditions that actually match what everybody else in the world is willing to give us, but what our own people, our own country is unwilling to give us. What we have actually, and again, back to hu human compassion means nothing. The, the, uh, uh, when applied the way that it's applied by the uh, social justice warrior is the reason why we have a lot of, the, the health service in Ireland is dependent on immigrant labor is because it's cheap. And so it's mm -hmm. they're badly paid. They have bad uh, working conditions and they have unacceptable working conditions for uh, for a European population, shall we say. And by definition, we also have working conditions within the health service and pay within the health service that would not attract, for example, nursing staff or doctors to come from the United States or from anywhere within the diaspora. But first and foremost, you 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 create the right of return. You make that absolute. Uh, then you create a, a, a society in Ireland, not just an economy, but an economy as well. Uh, but a society that is attractive to come home to and that people, Irish Americans who, who live abroad, second, third generation go, look, I see, I see where my own community is going around me. I see it, I see it falling apart. And I have this like ethnic and, and blood tie to this island of Ireland. And when I look at that island of Ireland now, I see a place that is working, not just economically, as I said, but socially as well. And I see an, an attractive place where I could get married and raise children and live a good life. And that's the main thing. Now, having said that, 
that rate of return if it, if if like 70 million people applied for it all at once well that wouldn't be an option either i think that i i don't mean to denigrate the phrase ireland is full too much because what what the people who are using it uh, mean by it is that the system cannot cater for the number of people who are in ireland now but the system is fundamentally flawed um when the system is fixed and the system is fixable, above all else, the system is fixable. It's not mm-hmm. that difficult. Uh, it's there are there are easy solutions. There are simple solutions. It's just that it takes political will and courage to, to, to engage in them. And it also takes a breaking free of the globalist mindset and the notion uh, of of dependence upon the European Union, for example, or dependence upon the the globalist capitalist economy in general. We can create these conditions and we can create them without any great difficulty. But the political will has to be there. The National Party has that political will. We have to convince the Irish people, not so much of what we want to do, because I think the vast majority of people uh, would want the society that we would try to create. But we have to convince them in the first instance that we are sincere, that we actually mean it, that we are actually going to do what we say we are going to do, that we are not just another corrupt group of politicians who are, have come in like along and gone, oh, well, here's a, here's a soap powder uh if you like that will sell uh, and no one else is selling this particular brand and so this is what we will sell we are not that um that's not the type of political party we are we don't work on focus groups we tell people things they don't want to hear a lot of the time and mm-hmm. uh many many times People have come to us and said, well, I would join your party, but I don't like your policy on this or I don't like your position on that. Uh, And we have said, well, that's not up for negotiation because this is what we have presented to people. And we have said, join us in the fight for these nine principles. And if you do, you will get those nine principles and you will get them in the form of government policy. And it would be a betrayal of those who have joined the party already if we were to say in order to gain new members uh, or to uh, become numerically stronger or financially stronger is that we would ditch some of those principles. We are, we, we are trying to create not only a new kind of society, but a new kind of politics and a politics that is fundamentally based on honesty and sincerity and telling telling it as it is and mm-hmm. if we're unpopular for telling it as it is then that's the price we pay for telling the truth but the truth is what we will always tell people and we will carry on with that and i have great confidence in the future uh, of this party i have great confidence in the future of this nation i have great confidence in our ability as one of the questions you asked earlier on, is to carry on the tradition of Irish nationalism, the realisation of the republic that is espoused in the proclamation of 1916, the great task of our generation. And beyond that, the next generation, my children's generation, will will find another task to, to, to carry the Irish people and the Irish nation forward to greater and greater achievements as time goes by because civilization is either in decay or it is in uprise. And I believe that the time for societal decay uh, that, 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 that marks a lot of the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century, the time for that is over. The time for, for, for allowing things to just fall apart um, and, and hiding from them as individuals are hiding from them uh, by pretending that they're not there is over too. And we we need to reinvigorate uh, civilization itself. Now, that should happen all through Europe. It'll have to happen all through Europe. And it will have, have to happen all through the Western world. But 
our responsibility specifically because we are a small country and we are a very small party in a very small country is but our specific responsibility is to the, the irish people and to the irish nation and we will fulfill fulfill that to the very best of our abilities and yes i will say this we will fulfill that obligation even on to death i certainly will i will draw my last breath in the fight for a new and a better ireland and if that's as a very old man then great uh what's got but if it's if it's blood across the street as well you know better men than me have done it uh i i don't begrudge my life and i don't think any uh, i don't think many national party members begrudge their lives either uh, in the cause of creating a a, a the free Irish nation that that was promised to us and that is our birthright. Now, um, I'm mindful of how much time you have left because we didn't get to discuss how long you have before the before the stream. So before I get into that, I just want to make sure you're okay to answer one or two more questions. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, what I've done is I've dropped... Now, this is something you can decide whether or not you want to do, but uh, I've dropped... I have a question or two of my own, but um, I've dropped a, a link into the live chat. If anybody wanted to ask Justin a question directly, that option is there. Um, obviously, I'll be I'll be moderating that. But um, the one thing I wanted to say to you is I've also heard you talking about the, the hope to revive the Irish language, but I was really stricken, and I've never heard it because um, I've never read Pierce, right? So um, I I had never heard the sentiment before, but it, it's something that felt so so right to me immediately was the idea that it's treasonous for somebody to hold uh, your inability to speak the Irish language over your head as a nationalist or as an Irishman, in Pierce's opinion, and I think in yours as well. And... Um, so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that, but also about what hope there is to really revive the Irish language as a widely spoken language rather than one that's just spoken in pockets and by everybody a little bit, but it but but fluently in pockets of the country. Yeah, well, to deal with what you've said first, this is this is extremely important because it is out there and it is a view that is expressed across the board is that you're somehow less Irish uh, if you don't speak the Irish language. Now, the, the, people who are familiar with Pierce's writings are, will, will be aware that, or, or with his life indeed, will be aware that he was an Irish language fanatic in many ways um you know this whole concept of scolena for example he was involved in the gaelic league he was uh, he was pushing 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 all the time for the advance of irish culture and and, and the irish language uh, and in particular the uh, spoken irish language because if you read very deeply into pierce you realize that when he uses the phrase the irish language he does not necessarily mean in ev all in every instance is the uh, the use of non English words. He said he talks about there is a language of the Irish people, a way in which we behave, a way in which we express ourselves. That is part of the language. That is not just us Gaelia. That it is that mm -hmm. is that we are inherently different. Uh, an English-speaking Irishman is inherently different than an Englishman anyway. But he does very roundly address the idea that anybody who attempts to create a divide between the English-speaking Irishman and the Irish-speaking Irishman is doing the work of the foreigner, is doing the work of the conqueror, is doing the work of the occupation power. And that in no sense whatsoever does it make one less of an Irish person to be unable to speak any of the Irish language, never mind have what most people who live on the island have, which is the cupola focal, but not, you know, fluent in any shape, fashion, or form. 
uh, and don't consider themselves uh, as Irish speakers. He's very clear, very, very clear and dogmatic about that is that it is doing the work of the occupation forces to try and suggest that the Irish speaking Irishman is somehow a better person or a better nationalist or is more Irish than the Irish speaker. Having said that, he is very much far the speaking of the Irish language as another differentiation between us, as another differentiation between us and other people. And it, and it's something that we were robbed of by the occupation power, that the vast majority of our people do not speak the native language anymore. Now, to advance the native language is, is a difficult prospect. But one of the things, again, that's, it's, it's kind of cliched, is to say, oh, well, the, the Irish free state made a mess of, of teaching the language. And to a certain extent, yeah, they did. In, they lost the enthusiasm of the Gaelic League and they enforced it in the schools. And by enforcing it in a particular way they did, um, and, and through the particular curriculum they did, uh, they created almost a hostility among Irish people to their own language. Having said that, having said that, I would be fundamentally opposed to the idea of the removal of mandatory Irish from Irish primary schools or secondary schools. And the reason why I would is because as bad as it is, the fact of the matter is, insofar as I personally have any Irish, insofar as the average Irish person has Irish uh, as words they recognise, and, and even down to pronunciations they recognise. Uh, if you see an Irish word, you're, you, even if you are not a native speaker, you will pronounce it correctly. A, a, an mm -hmm. Englishman will come and pronounce that in, in, in a completely different way. Uh, the classic example I have for that is um, uh, there's a, a fa farmer friend I know who's like grew up in England and uh, Chagask. Uh, he could, he still calls Tegask. He's just he's yeah. unable to get his head round it, and he's not he's not, he's not he's not a stupid man, like you know. But it's just <laughs> it's not in his brain to pronounce uh, the, those letters as Chagask, whereas yeah. Irish people who don't have any notion of the language as such. We see a word in Irish and we, we instinctively know how to pronounce it. And that has to be a result. Of, uh, perhaps it's a result of race memory to some extent and, and passed down through the DNA. But it also has to be a credit to an extent to the education system that even badly done and uh, mandatory uh, Irish does keep the language alive at a very basic level. But we need a renewed enthusiasm, the, the enthusiasm of the Gaelic League uh, for the language, if it's ever to become the spoken language of, of the common man in, in Ireland again. That enthusiasm can only come, and it only came then too, with a revival of the idea of Irishness. It cannot be done in a hobby horse fashion, which is mm -hmm. to, um, to, you know, I want to learn a new language, you know, what, what, well, what language should I learn? Well, I'll learn Irish. Well, it's highly unlikely that that's what you will actually do in practice because, because for, for practical purposes, for practical purposes, English is the easiest language to move around the world with. And, um, and if you were going learning a foreign language, French, German, or at this stage, Han Chinese would actually be probably the, the, the most practically useful language to learn. So it's never going to be, a, a Irish is never going to be the most practical language for you to learn as a second language. You will only do so, and you will only commit to doing so, if it is about more than speaking words in a different way. 
And so it must be accompanied by a national feeling and an upsurge of a national feeling and an upsurge of a, for, of a love of country, of a patriotism, of a, a belief in who you are and the uniqueness of who you are as an Irish person uh, and what you share in common with the people around you as Irish people. And that is much more motivating to, to learn the language uh, than practicalities would be or, um, or, for that matter, just mandatorily teaching it in schools. But I would say I'd be absolutely opposed to removing it from the schools altogether. But when there is a revival of the national spirit, when there is a revival of nationalism, when it, when it is no longer denigrated, when it is no longer insulted, when it is no longer labelled as these various derogatory terms, as, but to use, excuse me, Hall Martin's phrase uh, uh, for Fianna Fáil, is Fianna Fáil wants no, um, wants no part in a backward looking idea of Irish sovereignty. That when that's when, when that is spoken by the leader of the country, then you can't expect the Irish language to prosper or the Irish language to spread among the population in general. So in the oh, first instance, uh, yeah, yes, keep it modern. Uh, uh, keep it modern, keep it mandatory. Uh, uh, and make it part of our political ideology as well, our, our worldview, if you want to broaden it out to that, that the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at ourselves in, uh, uh, as part of the world, that we want to be as Irish as we can be. And the Irish language then and Irish sports and Irish music and Irish culture in general all become part of what we strive for and desire and want for ourselves and the need to make it to, to force it on people becomes less but in the cosmopolitan globalist notion of the world that we have at the moment you know Irish the Irish language in fact has become a snobbish thing to, to be honest uh, or at least that's my perception of it it's mm -hmm. um, the, the more like the more Irish somebody's name is and the more Gaelicized their name is, the more the further to the left they're likely to be politically. I don't understand why that is the case, but it is. And the more likely they are to be um, to look down on everything else that's Irish other than the language. So back to Pierce, he says, do not divide the Irish people on the basis of saying people who speak Irish are better Irishmen and women than people who do not speak Irish. Uh, do not divide them on that basis. That is treasonous. That is, as you said, that is wrong. That is immoral. But the National Party, nonetheless, uh, what's got advances the idea that the, the language can be revived and should be revived. That thing that you pointed out about how the further left they are, the, the more Irish and over the top the name is, you know, these names that maybe never even existed. I've seen them, you know, like if you're people kind of invent these these Irish names that, you know, you, you, you might never have been. But um, the just theoretically, I was thinking while you were saying it there, could it be something to do with I, I have this this sense that there's um uh there's a, a sort of an emptiness the further you go left in terms of everything you, you need tokens that make you interesting and they engage so much and it's almost like a token wearing a badge wearing thing for their facebook profile that they can be fenula ni kula coin or whatever on on facebook and then their australian friends and their american friends can think that they're very ethnic and interesting because part of their ideology is this this hatred of white right so they need to be more ethnic. It's almost, you know, so you get a few commas in there, or sorry, a few fadas in there, and you get the knee between the name or the O between the name, and suddenly you're not just a white person. You're now, you're ethnic, right? You're a minority group. So could it be something to do with that? It could certainly have something to do with that because um, 
like again in, in the political discourse, one of the things that comes up again and again is this notion that the Irish people cannot be opposed to immigration because Irish people immigrated to other countries. Now, Irish people emigrated to largely empty countries for a start. And second of all, if you want to get into it, uh, immigration and allowing on mass immigration didn't go too well for the people who lived there when, when, when it happened. Uh, but, but there is a sense in the political discourse that, you know, uh, if we can say that the Irish people immigrated abroad, therefore uh, we must allow immigrants into Ireland, is that we have a shared uh, history of um, oppression. And therefore that makes us more like them than, than, than like the English. And um, are like any of the, Euro the European nations. Now, on on the other hand, of course, the British must take immigrants because they had an empire and they ruled over these people. So there's, it doesn't matter what you actually, your people historically speaking did, it always ends up with you have to take immigrants. If you oppressed people like during your history, then you must take immigrants. If you were oppressed, you must identify with immigrants. But I think you were hit, you've hit on something there, is an attempt to, I, to, to, disassociate ourselves from our European heritage by almost narrowing the gap uh, in order to broaden the gap. If, if you, This kind of paradox mm -hmm. is narrow the, the gap of what it means to be Irish to such a narrow extent that we no longer share a European heritage Therefore, as an oppressed people, as in a colonized people, we can be part of the non-white world, uh, which was oppressed by, or supposedly oppressed by the various empires. Now, when I say supposedly oppressed, I do mean that. Uh, what the conditions in which they were found were not very much uh, better than conditions in which they were left. Yeah largely speaking and the amount of oppression that european empires engaged in 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 a lot of these countries is massively exaggerated but that's neither here nor there i'm i'm not here to defend uh, uh the you know the the conquest of africa or anything like that what i what i'm saying though is that yes it is there you, you i think you've hit upon something and i have I actually haven't thought of this before, but you may be quite correct here, and it's something I'll carry into the next interview and pretend it was my own idea. <laughs> but no, I won't. I'll give you credit for it. But oh, great, wonderful. That, that um, yeah, it's a way of of detaching ourselves from our European heritage, which is very important too. And the EU is not our European heritage. The European Union is a political institution. It's not our European heritage. We are part of Europe as, as a people because we are part of Europe. That's what we are ethnically. That's what we are uh, by blood. That's what we are by general culture. And we have a specific form of European in in Irish culture and that makes us distinct and that's what gives us the, the basis and the birthright for national and political independence but that does not make us not European but on the left mm -hmm. yeah I could see the attraction of, of a very obscure form of Gaelicism which would detach us from Europe and detach us from our European cultural heritage and therefore allow us to legitimately de-white ourselves uh, and become a, a part of the oppressed masses of the world. But then we would just be a parody of ourselves. We would be a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. They don't see it that way. Uh, we, we, we have already seen the, the, um, the demonstrations by... Uh, non-white immigrants in Ireland blaming the Irish for slavery. 
And yeah. um, I don't doubt it's made perhaps some individual Irishmen own slaves over the history of the entire world. But the fact of the matter is, is that there is nothing endemic about slavery to the Irish people other than having endured it. And yet, when the other races look at us, uh, they see Europeans. And if we don't see Europeans, they certainly do. And they are quite simply not, not going to allow us to become the white saviors that we would like to think, or the left would like to think we are. Um, we see this again uh, with some of these socialist justice warriors who, who, who uh, particularly the poor misfortunate uh, um, young women who have done so, who have gone out to Calais, uh, to the jungle of Calais, to help these poor people out there. And they encounter, let's just say they, they go in, but they never come out. And sometimes we find out what happens to them. Uh, sometimes we don't. Uh, we had the, the, the famous backpackers in, in North Africa who went there, the two young women, with this purpose of proving that two young women on their own could travel across North Africa safely. Well, they can't. That's what they proved. It can't be done. And I think that's a lesson for everybody, is that they weren't seen. Um, and, 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 and there's no point in going, oh, look, I'm Irish. Uh, what's, when, when confronted with a scenario that the other side sees in racial terms. Uh, you can be colorblind, but color is not blind to you. And it, it's, it's, it's a delusion of the left to think that if there was a majority non-white population in Ireland or non-Irish population in Ireland, that the majority black population would then accept oh, you were one of the good Irish people who was pro-immigration and, uh, and say Justin Barrett was one of the bad ones. Uh, they will not make that differentiation. Um, uh, they, will, they will not care and, uh, and it will not matter. And the, the obscure Irish names will, will, uh, will have their houses burnt out just the same as I will. Um, um, if that day should come, uh, which obviously it is our determination will not come or will not come anywhere near coming about the situation that they've had in France, which is, they call the civil war, for example. They've been calling the, the situation in France over the past few weeks a civil war. There's no civil war. In order to have a civil war, you need French people to be fighting French people. That's what a civil war is. The Irish civil war was Irishmen fighting Irishmen. The American civil war was Americans fighting Americans. In France, you have foreigners who have rebelled against the French government. That's what you have. That's not a civil war. It's a war. But it's not a civil war. It's a war of an invading army within French territory, which ought to rightly have been, and I can tell you, if it was a national party government and it was in Ireland, it would be. It ought to have been military. Should have been done on the basis of protecting the French state from a foreign invasion, because that's exactly what it was. And it will happen again and again and again. And it will be a series of, of, of waves of this violence, which, of course, if the numbers keep going up, also the, the waves of violence will be bigger and will last longer and will be more difficult to put down until eventually, if nothing is done, if there is no political solution found, one of these days, there will be no end to the actual to what are called riots. There will be no end to them, and France will simply collapse uh, and become a failed state. And again, Ireland is no different. We are we are we are farther back down the line in terms of the numbers of foreigners we have, uh, the the degree in which they homogeneously hate us, and so on and so forth. But 
the, the, what we are seeing playing out in France, what we're seeing playing out in Sweden, what we're seeing playing out in, in, in Britain. In Britain, we had the, to talk about a civil war. In Britain, they had an absurd example uh, of a town in, in, in England in which the white indigenous British population was so small that the riot and the fight was between Hindus and Muslims. There were no English people involved <laughs> at all. There was a civil war in the town between two ethnic groups, both of whom were foreign. While I, I don't know what the, the uh, indigenous English people did in that village, I presume they boarded up their windows and, and waited for it to pass. Um, yeah. I don't want my children growing up in, in an Ireland in which they have to board up the windows of their house if they have a house, because that's another thing, if they even have a house, uh, while a civil war from 4,000 miles away is played out in the streets of Dublin or in the streets of, God knows, small towns like Mullingar yeah. or uh, what's called at Loan or, or places like that. Um, it's a nightmare vision. And yet it is the reality of modern French life. It's the reality of modern British life. It's the reality of modern European life in general. Uh, something must, something has to give. And either it will be the collapse of Western civilization or it will be the revival of Western civilization. But something has to give. The game is up on multiculturalism. The game is up on integration. The game is up on um, everything will be fine and we'll all be friends together. We're still mm -hmm. playing that game in Ireland. We're still pretending that's possible. But nobody in Europe believes that anymore. Uh, nobody on either side believes that anymore. And the left uh, believe in handing the, the, the nations over completely. And the right are fighting a a rear guard action to try and protect the nation states of Europe. But nobody believes anymore in multiculturalism or that that will work or that integration will happen or that there will be this fine day of sunshine and flowers in which nobody has any a, a, any angst with, with, with each other over religious, cultural, ethnic differences and so on and so forth. The way to, to, to deal with these matters peacefully is for people to practice their religion in their own country, for people to practice their culture in their own country, for people to live in ethnic communities that are homogenous. These are high trust communities. These are more successful communities. And certainly in the European sense, uh, they are, we, we, our backs are to the wall. This, this little island of ours, this is all we've got. We don't, we don't have anywhere else to go. We don't have any place to retreat to. We don't have a right of return. No one can give us a right of return um, like we might be able to offer to Irish Americans. This is it. This is where we started and this is where we'll finish. Uh, or this is where we will survive. The National Party is determined is, this is where we will survive. This is where we will survive and we will prosper and we will grow. And we will defend our nation to the very last drop of blood if necessary. Excellent, excellent. Um, and how would you encourage people to get out and support the National Party? Well, in the first instance, and it's the simplest instance, is to literally just join the party. Join the party at a very like basic level. You can do that on the website. You go to the join page uh, and you join the party and somebody will be in touch with you from the from party headquarters or from the local area very shortly afterwards with a view to having a bit of a chat to see how how much you want to be involved. And if you want to just be a paper member, then be a paper member. That's that's at least that's doing something. At least that's doing something. But if you mm -hmm. want to be actively involved, that will be explained to you in, in, in more detail by your local activist group. And uh, a representative from that group will, will come and have, literally just have a chat with you as to look what you see, you know. Um, there's there's leafleting to be done. There's campaigning to be done. There's um, uh, 
banner drops to be done. There's um, what's called we've involved ourselves in community work with the various groups that have been opposed to the DP centres and and for other purposes as well. And uh, and in the long run, um, we we look forward to shall we say when more and more people realize that what we have been saying is number one is 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 true uh number two we're sincere about it and number three we're capable of doing something about it is that uh we will gain significant electoral support as well as indeed has the far right in on the continent and we will use every means every means necessary uh to but as individuals the first step as always the first step is is to sign up sign up to join uh to become part of the struggle for a free ireland and how far you take that personally then afterwards that is up to your own conscience and that is up to your own willingness to engage um as for me, it's my whole life now. It's a, it's 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 everything. Uh, it's and and for a lot of okay, have we lost Justin? I'm not sure. His internet is woeful, so from time to time, I know he drops out. But this is a particularly long one. Okay, while he's gone, just want to say, everybody who's watching for the first time, please like, please subscribe. Um, and anybody who would like to get in and ask Justin a question, in the off chance that he does come back, which he might, um, the link's there if you would like to ask him a question in person, or if you'd like to ask me a question in person, um, and feel free to click it. Now, I don't think he's going to come back, because this has been a particularly long time. Yeah, he's gone. All right, I'll give him a, the, the, the link's there, so I'll give him maybe a minute or two. It's been nearly two hours now anyway, and, I and you know, it's awkward when the internet is, is as bad as it is with him. So I'll give him a minute or two if he wants to jump back in, but we were kind of closing up anyway, so he might not. Um, yeah, I think it was a great stream. That was very interesting for me. I actually learned some things about the National Party. Uh, my own personal perspective is I'm, I've been kind of jaded with politics for the last few years, so I would have considered myself basically a non-voter altogether because I just don't believe in it. Um, but one of the guys I know, Rua, there in the chat, he's been kind of talking about the National Party a good bit, and he's been trying to convince me and others that there is some legs to it and there's a... There's a a good feeling to uh, to what they're doing and that it isn't just another party. So um, I was very excited to get him on and talk to him about that. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like he's going to be back. So I'll be back again next Saturday. I have no idea who ended on a great note anyway. Yes, it did end on a great note, I mean. Um, I have no idea who... Oh, hold on. Who do I have now? I have certainly... Oh, I think I have Cal Washington on Friday at 8 o'clock. That's who I'll be interviewing. So anybody who doesn't know Cal Washington, check him out, figure out who he is. Um, anybody who does, you'll obviously be really excited. But that's who I'm interviewing next week. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Then I'll try and still do my Saturday slot if I'm not too lazy. <laughs> what does Justin think of Bibi and Bertaria? I don't think Justin has time for Bertaria. He's too busy building Airtaria. But, um, oh, he is back. He is back. So let's see if this works. Hey, Justin, how are you? You're back. Yes, I'm back. I just disappeared there. Uh, what's got my internet connection went entirely. Don't ask me um, to explain <laughs> that because uh, I don't know enough about the technical safari. It's just literally was gone. I have no idea what the last thing I was saying was. Well, I have an idea what the last thing I was saying was, but I've no idea what the last thing everybody heard was. Yeah, Um I think you uh, I think you ended pretty much I think you were just like finishing up at that moment anyway. I'm I'm nearly certain. But if you want to continue tell me where you were. Well, you see I don't know what's the last thing. Okay, okay, okay. 
guys, what what was the last thing you guys heard? Can anybody give me a give me a pointer here to kind of to probe this? Irene especially. Irene says it ended on a great note, so Irene should know where you were. Okay, well, I'm not certain either. I've kind of lost a... Uh, no time for nonsense, she says. It's the last time. It's the last thing that she heard you saying. It was no time for nonsense. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, can't, I can't fit... Yeah, I can't fit that into a... Okay. A, a, a conceptual context either. Except yeah, there is yeah, yeah. no time for nonsense. I will... I, I, I grant I mean she's absolutely correct. We, we've had enough nonsense now and... <laughs> But I can't fit it into the context <laughs> of what I was saying before. But I, but as a standalone statement, it's it's absolutely correct. Yes. So, um, well, I'll 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 move it forward regardless. And what I was going to point out is, um, the buzz wrecker in the chat had a had an idea. Um, now I'm going to paraphrase him a little bit, but he was wondering, um, what if we could associate speaking Irish with, um with victim consciousness and uh, all the liberal values and, uh, you know, gayness and everything else, then maybe we could guarantee that this one big segment of society would be, would, maybe that could be a policy to get things moving. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that not working. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a joke. How, it's a joke how can yeah. I be? Uh, 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 how can I be nice <laughs> about this and <laughs> and say that um, the Irish language um, it, it will die with them if they uh, become the representatives of it. That's oh, perfect. That's, I'll just put, put I'll just put it uh, uh, because I, I, I'll have no further interest in it <laughs> and I know a lot of people <laughs> will have no further interest in it um, if it, but also, if it also becomes of part them. of the uh, victim and in fact I, 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 I object to the victim complex of uh, that Irish people, that some Irish people have anyway, that we are like, yes we've had a rough history Yes, we've had a, a tough time. Yes, uh, what's got we've gone through some terrible uh, historical events. But sitting around in 2023 going, like, you know, uh, the, the famine was terrible. Um, well, yes, it was. It was for them. It's not for you. You're, you're sitting there on a couch, probably uh, the, the very people saying it, probably quite obese. <laughs> sitting there bemoaning the famine uh, uh, between joints and, and uh, what's God and the fact that we're not a socialist republic. You know, this, I reject the victim mentality. That is not Ireland's... That is... First of all, it's only very recent Irish history um, because we were, were a very proud European nation and a very mainstream European nation until relatively a short length of time ago in... in in world historical terms. And the second thing, that is not our future. Our future is not whinging about what happened to somebody else in the past. It is not mm -hmm. the responsibility uh, of anybody in the world. Uh, no one owes us a living because our ancestors uh, suffered. If they can go back, uh, if we could go back and repay them, for their suffering, then, then then that's fine. If there's anybody left alive today who suffered from British colonialism in Ireland, then fine. And indeed, uh, what's got in the six counties that there's a, a very strong case for mm -hmm. there to be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, reconciliation based on justice there. Uh, but for somebody uh, like myself who lived my whole life uh, in the Republic, um, uh, whether like a Tipperary, Cork, uh, Dublin or wherever, to be whining about uh, how I've suffered from British colonialism is, 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 is parody. It's actually mm. parody at this point. Um, 
we have a problem uh, with a foreign power occupying the six counties. Uh, we have a had an oppressed population within this generation, but that is no excuse for those of us who made a mess of the free state. That is our own doing and our own fault. And, and, and if we continue to make a mess of it, that will be our own doing and our own fault. And if we make a mess of a united Ireland, that would be our own doing and our own fault. And uh, we can't lay it on anybody else. Um, yes, the British have a responsibility. I'm going to say it straight. The British, have a, the British government has a responsibility to abandon its claim of sovereignty on the six counties of Northern Ireland. That it must do. And then we can start to talk about uh, progressing beyond a history of oppression. But for me to pretend that I've been personally oppressed by Britain is an, is an absurdity. Uh, uh, for most Irish people to pretend that they have been personally oppressed is an absurdity. I don't, I don't live in West Belfast. I'm, I'm sure it's the feeling there is very visceral and, uh, and, they, and, 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 and very justified. Um, but I don't see a nationalism built, built on a victim complex creating anything. I see it just sitting in a corner, rocking back and forth with the lights off for centuries. And uh, that's not the National Party's vision of, of, of the future. And I think it's held back many colonial uh, or ex-colonial people that they think they can, they can blame every problem on what happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago or whatever. And in, in America, that they say the, the like black population can blame everything that happens to them today on the fact that they were ancestors were slaves before 1865. This is, you know, I hate to be like, guys, get over it. Like, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. happened. Get over it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of a madness. It's almost a, a, it's a fashion of the day, I think, that it's, you need to be able to have that victim card that you can wave and people will look anywhere. And I don't think it's an, it's a, it's a natural part of Irish culture to associate with uh, times when you've been victimized in the past. I think it, it's quite the opposite, actually. Yeah. I, I, I personally look to historical figures uh, who I take great pride in. Uh, them being my forebears. Um, Pierce himself said, for example, uh, what's got that England will rule Ireland as long as the Irish people deserve it. And what he meant by that was, uh, what's got, we need to stand on our own two feet and we need to defy the, the, the foreign occupation and we need to defy it with pride, not, not by uh, whining about how unfortunate we are. Uh, even in those days, uh, his position was not. Uh, we, we, as a nation, we have so much to be proud of, and so much to live for, and so much to give us a sense of ourselves and a sense of our own confidence in what we can do as a people. That the idea that we would revert to some kind of victim complex, and and that that would be our national future, is is. It's just such a despair and such a negative uh, attitude to have. While the occupation force is there, as I say, in the six counties, is, there's, there's little else one can do in West Belfast, as I say, or in the uh, Tyrone, Fermanagh, or Derry, uh, what's called. A, a, there's, when, when, when one watches the Orange Parade's triumphalist, um, sectarian nonsense going through your area. Uh, your reaction should not be, uh, oh, the Orange Order are victimizing us. Is uh, what's got, if you don't mind, I'm going to use a soft curse word here and just go feck off. 
just feck off out of our head. <laughs> we don't want this this Iron Charter anymore. No, we're, we're not victims of the Iron Charter. We're not victims of your triumphalism. We're not victims of your lambeg drums or your flutes. We, do, we say just feck off out of our area. Go home to England. Go home to Britain if that's really where you feel you belong. But there is no place anymore on this island for the Union Jack or for any form of British sovereignty. And if that's what you want, there's a place where British sovereignty exists. I suggest, by the way, don't go back to Scotland because British sovereignty is not going to last too long there either. <laughs> You're going to have to go. And you can't go to London because it's majority non-English now. I really don't know where you are going to go, but uh, uh, through the Garvahi Road, you're not. That's that's all I'll say. Through the Garvahi Road, you're not going bringing your Britishness. It's over. It's done. It's it's finished. It's gone. Yeah, yeah, and it's becoming clearer and clearer that that is a. Uh... That is on the cards in certainly in my lifetime in your lifetime that we're, we're, we we should see we should see some serious moves up there i think right i think um it is inevitable it's dem again it's back to the kind of argument about mass immigration it's demographically inevitable it's no longer uh, the even when it was set up in 1921, uh, the the six county state was not a stable political entity anyway. But as the demographics have shifted sharply uh, in the direction of uh, nationalism or a, a form of non-unionism anyway, if not nationalism, because Sinn Féin can't really be called nationalism. So let's call it non-unionism. A united Ireland is inevitable. A political united Ireland is inevitable. The only question, the only question that's really up for discussion or for debate or for argument is what kind of united Ireland we're going to have. And that is where the real argument is. Politically speaking, there, there, there is not much time for the six county state to run. Uh, anybody who is foolish enough to believe that the six county state will last more than twenty more years is is. I I really don't know. Um, are they, are they just being emotional or what? I don't know. Uh, they're certainly not engaging their their uh, intellect. Uh, I, I, I don't believe that even the most hardened unionist orange order, lambeg drum beating, whatever, is capable of foreseeing a scenario in which uh, this six county state can be maintained for very much longer. Um, it's it's over. It's done with. Uh, what 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 comes after? It's what's up for for discussion. What comes after? It's what's up for argument. The union, the 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 United Kingdom is finished. Uh, Scotland will will leave the union within twenty years as well, if not within five. Um, and that will be the end of the union. Uh, what are what are what are you a unionist to? And who are you loyal to? Like Charles Hanover, like uh, Saxe of Coburg and Gotha, or whatever the hell his uh, his German ancestry. What is what what is this about? Yeah. Like exactly, he's not. It's the the man's not even English. Like you know, his his heritage is 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 German. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, you got rid of your 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 British king. Uh, what's called? You got rid of your British dynasty and you replaced it with some Germans. And and now, uh, you you're determined to be loyal to that. And 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 you were say, ironically enough, the absurdity of the UVF, the the Ulster Volunteer Force, in way back in. 
the early part of the 20th century was saved from its own absurdity by a great, even greater absurdity, which was the First World War. Because really, were, were the, was, was loyalism going to fire upon the British army? And if the loyalists were going to fire on the British army, then what did, what kind of loyalism was that? You yeah. know, it's like they were to, they were going to go into rebellion against the government they were loyal to. It never made yeah. a hell of a lot of sense. And the absurdity of that was short-circuited by the even greater monstrosity of the absurdity of the First World War, and it never uh, it was never tested. And then subsequent to the, the uh, First World War and uh, the free creation of the free state and so forth, you had the orange state. It's the only way to describe it. It was, it was the orange state. It wasn't really part of Britain either, even then. It was uh, It was just a, a Protestant-dominated, orangist state that everybody uh, in Britain preferred to pretend it didn't exist. And then... We, you know, we we move on to the late sixties, early seventies, and the a civil rights movement turning into the IRA campaign, and so on, and so forth. And the whole thing came back again, uh, and couldn't be brushed under under the carpet or or ignored anymore. But at this point, demographics is destiny. Demographics is always destiny, and whether it's mass immigration that needs to be stopped and can be stopped uh, across Europe. What cannot be stopped is the demographics within the six county area uh, make for it no longer be, being possible to maintain that um, failed state. It was always a failed state, but it was a viable in, a, in its own awkward way. But the demographics say, no, it's over. It's over. It's gone. It's it's finished. Um, so you've inspired. You've inspired a few questions uh, and a few remarks that I'll sort of call out to you and let you respond. Um, so Droopy, first of all, says, you'll have to appease loyalists. This feck off attitude will work against you. Oh, uh, when I say, uh, if you actually, uh, I don't know if the, the uh, person in question is uh, from the six county area. Because if he is, uh, what's called, he should know that loyalists, there are two uh, elements to the Protestant community. There are the loyalists and there are the unionists. And they are not the same thing. Now, you may, a, a lot of people think they are, but if you actually go and talk to actual Protestant people from the six county area, they will tell you that they have nothing in common with the UVF or loyalism or any of the, the associated trappings of that. Uh, they are unionist in a more political uh, way and that they do not have this tribal allegiance. In fact, they decry the, the, the um, paramilitary violence of, of the loyalists. Uh, as much as they would uh, Republican violence. In fact, uh, from the, those that I've talked to, they, they understand Republican paramilitary violence. They don't agree with it, but they understand it better than they understand that, that there was paramilitary violence from their own side. You have to, we have to deal with a community in the North, which is currently hostile to being part of a united Ireland. That is something we have to do in a very open and a very um, realistic way. But when I used the term feck off earlier on, I was speaking very much of, as I said, the lambeg drum we're going down the Garvahi Road and we're going to call it Drum Cree, whether it's whether it is or it isn't. Um, Union Jack waving uh, Protestant sectarian. He cannot play 
or she cannot play a role in the political discussions. They must be sidelined. And I think the vast majority of people who are concerned, who would regard themselves as unionists now, uh, are uh, opposed to United Ireland. They know that the six-county state is not sustainable. They know they must come to a political arrangement with the rest of the island. And they do want a generous settlement from the rest of the island. But, um, so I would very much differentiate between those two terms. And, I, and the Protestants I have spoken to from Northern Ireland, and I mean, I don't mean like nationalist Protestants, because there are plenty of nationalist Protestants in Northern Ireland, a lot more than people think. Um, but I'm, I've talked to many unionists, uh, and I uh, and all of the reasonable ones, all of the reasonable ones, have accepted that they want nothing to do with and no association with loyalist um, sectarianism. And so they're the people who I would say we need to tell to feck off, same way as we needed to tell the. Uh, psychopathic murderers on on uh, on any side of a political debate that they need to leave the room they can't be talked to they can't be discussed that stuff can't be discussed with them you can't negotiate with terrorists so that's what i'm talking about uh as i say if if the the person who who spoke there uh what's called is from northern ireland and is a, a unionist or from a unionist background, he will know his own community draws a very uh, distinct line between loyalist extremists and what they call mainstream unionism, or at least he ought to. I am being very surprised mm. if he doesn't. Some loyalists don't. They think they represent the whole unionist community. They do not. They do not, 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 not in any shape, fashion or form. Um, so... You know, so what I would say to him is, I was very specific about who 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 needs to keep, who needs to be uh, leave the room when we're discussing uh, a a new Ireland, a united Ireland. Um, that's not everybody who would currently vote for a unionist party, uh, but uh, it ex I would say excludes the Orange Order. Yeah, that does. It does. You cannot. So you, you, you cannot negotiate with those people. So he responded to you, uh, made you talking, and and then at the end. So I'll tell you both responses. While you were talking, he just pointed out that unionists would use or hide behind loyalists when it suited them. But by the time you finished talking, he just said fair points. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um. So the other, the other, the other question you had. Now this is the question you'll hear anywhere, which is: the South can't afford to move all civil service jobs up north to subsidise the economy there. The southern car, southern state cannot afford pretty much to exist uh, without foreign direct investment as a tax haven. So uh, that's a. Um, that's a non sequitur, if you like. That's that's just you know there is an a, there is an assumption behind the National Party nor United Ireland that we have a functioning economy in the South and that we will bring that functioning economic system uh, to the six county area as well. And so, can, yeah, if you're asking, can the twenty six counties subsidize the six counties? Uh, first of all, no. Uh, and second of all, we shouldn't. Uh, there is no reason why any part of Ireland needs to subsidise any other part of Ireland. That's that's um, that 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 also should be a, a, a kind of a principle, a, 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 mm -hmm. with the exception perhaps that you you have things like public transport that's not particularly profitable that goes to areas that like are a bit remote and obscure. But but the whole idea of the twenty six counties subsidizing the six counties no i i wouldn't agree with it in principle even if we had the money to do it uh well this the six counties area integrated into the 26 
uh, into a, the 32 can be made into a functioning economy that where they um, where no part of Ireland needs to be subsidized and as the six county area does not become a cost. Uh, that that's not the way to look at it. In any case, even if they were an economic cost, there are people, and our people belong in our nation, and uh, and to be counting uh, money uh, as the the well, the only basis on which a nation should exist. That's that's one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in is that we have we we have for at least a hundred years we have confused the idea of nation with economy and every government and every political party of every political persuasion mind you and even where there are genuine differences and you know, in ireland they're small enough but even where there are genuine differences they all agree the economy is the most important thing it isn't it's it it, it actually just isn't the economy mm -hmm. is the means by which we survive and the means by which we survive is the means by which we are able to do the things that we are supposed to do as human beings. In other words, the economy is only a means to an end. The, uh, the nation is the end. Um, so I don't believe that we will have to subsidize the six counties. Uh, in a United Ireland situation. I don't believe the current economic system in either uh, parts of this island is functioning properly in a, in a way that, that could support an independent state. Uh, we're a tax haven in the south. Uh, what's got uh, the six counties is heavily subsidised by the British Exchequer. Neither one of those uh, two states are functioning as either as nations or as economies at the moment but an Irish nation can function as an economy and again back to principle number six how we organize the economy on the lines of free productive enterprise the rights of private property and the elimination of state socialism and monopoly capitalism that's a functioning economy that's a national community and yet there's nothing that needs to be subsidized about that um the only thing that that um, the only thing that we need to do is put our minds to the work that's ahead of us. Excellent. Gaelic Ireland just says, "Ta." <laughs> um, Justin, that's great. I don't have any other I questions for you. That. <laughs> but I've argued, uh, but I've uh, I've really really enjoyed the uh, the interview. Um, it's we're coming up on two and a half hours now, so I think I should let you go. Um, the last thing I was going to um point out was just I'd like to reiterate the idea that you mentioned on uh, Keith Woods' stream, Keith Wood, yeah, Keith Woods' stream, that um almost more important than people getting out and voting for um the the national party is people to to say that they're going out to vote for the National Party. I thought that was an interesting idea, and I'd like to finish up on that, and then I'll let you go. Um, yes, uh, what's got? Well, you know, everything is public presence. And if there is not a sense that they, like, there, if there's not a, there is a sense that we are a fringe party at the moment, and to, to a certain extent, by nature of being a small party, that is that puts you at the fringe. We have no elective representatives at the moment, but we need people to come out, uh, what's got, and loudly proclaim. As I said, the, the very basic minimum: join the party, join, sign up, be a paper member at least. Uh, what's got you making some contribution to the Irish national cause? But more than that, uh, what's got be very vocally nationalist, be very vocally national party, be very vocal. And tell people the same way as other people. I tell you, one of the things that that that's part of the Sinn Fein wave at the moment is that that anybody who's voting for Sinn Fein is very, they want they'll be embarrassed in five six years time, mind you. But that's it's neither here nor there. At the moment, uh, they're very proud of the fact that they're going to vote for Sinn Fein and they're going to vote for change and everything's going to be different and everything's going to be better and it's going to be uh, like, you know, sunshine and roses, uh, what's caught, uh, free ice cream and whatever. Um, we need our nationalists to do the same, to be very vocally 
like uh, nationalist, be very openly nationalist, and to advocate it in a very positive way. <laughs> Anti-immigration sentiment is all very well and, and has its place, um, as it were, in, in terms of rhetoric and in terms of making points uh, when you're discussing things with people. But we're not, we're not anti-immigration because we're anti-immigrant. Uh, we're anti-immigration because Ireland has is is a homeland for the Irish people, and can only be a homeland for the Irish people if it is made up of Irish people. And in order to maintain a state as a nation, a state as a nation must have people within it who are proud of their nation and proud of who they are, and so. Yeah, it's fine if people sneak out to the ballot box and very quietly vote for the National Party candidate. We'll take what we can get, but we would much prefer people to be uh, willing to march down a road with us on a public demonstration to indicate to everybody, look, we are a coming force, okay? We're small still. Our group is small still, relatively speaking. We have grown a lot in the last few years, mind you, but relatively speaking, we're still a small group. Let's make us visibly a bigger group. And when there is that visibly bigger group that people see in the streets, then they will say to themselves, this is the alternative. This is the way to go. This is the, these are the people who will uh, lead us out of the mess that we have collectively allowed ourselves to be got into uh, by globalist forces and by traitorous government. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Um, one question came up while we're doing that, uh, if you're interested in answering it. Otherwise, guys, after this, there's no more questions. I'm going to leave it at that and we're going to close up. How can we stop the Union Jacks flying in air while Ukraine and gay flags are flying in Ireland? Well, I would like to see a situation where nobody wants to uh, fly a Union Jack. I don't mean to make it illegal, but I, I would I would like to see a situation in which uh, people were uh, embarrassed uh, to have a gay flag uh, uh, flying. Uh, people were embarrassed to have a, a, a foreign flag in the form of the Ukraine or uh, any other country for that matter. Ireland is a neutral country. We have no issue with the Russians and we have no issue with the Ukrainians insofar as they live in Ukraine. Um, um, but look, if if there's some lunatic in somewhere in Tipperary who wants to, to run a Union Jack <laughs> <laughs> up, 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 up. I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not going down to to, to uh, like kick in his door. You know, it's like it's, <laughs> maybe the uh, health service might look into it. Uh, there, there might be a section in, under the Mental Health Act for it. But otherwise, um, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But um, you know, there always that's... be there always be crazy people. Yeah, <laughs> they're always crazy people. But I would, but I would, but I would like to see a situation uh, talking about like open and visible nationalism. And I, uh, outside my own house, I have, I do have it. Is a tricolor flying? I don't see that it's you necessarily have to support the national party or uh, any like political party per se. Uh, what's got you? I think. Ordinary Irish people, I would encourage them to 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 fly the the. It it's, it kind of happened as a phenomenon in around the the centenary of nineteen sixteen and then disappeared again for some reason, but it, oh, just ordinary people would just say, "Look, this is my flag. This is my identity. I am Irish. I watch God. I I fly the Irish flag outside my house. Uh, um, it's no particular statement per se." I, it is a statement for me, obviously, uh, what's God, but it's, it's no big deal. Um, it's our country's flag. It's, um, yeah. I would like to see a situation in which that was a common thing uh, and that was an ordinary thing to see uh, as a, an expression of, of the, 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 the cloth 
is not the important thing. The colors indeed are not even the important thing. It's what it represents. It represents who we are and that we are proud of ourselves. And when we fly that flag, that we are saying, yes, we are the Irish people. We have a proud history and we have a proud future awaiting us. And we are proud of ourselves as a people. And we have nothing to be ashamed of as a people. And, uh, and that flag represents that. And I see no reason why it shouldn't be everywhere. And that, uh, and that everybody shouldn't fly it uh, at all times. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be a special occasion. It doesn't need to be St. Patrick's Day or something like that. And for Irish Americans to put up your um, uh, tricolors as well and <laughs> remind people that. Uh, but put them up with besides your uh, put put them up beside your stars and stripes. I'm not saying uh, you shouldn't, but um, but let let people know like that you. Um, that you're proud of your ethnic heritage, that you're proud of Ireland, that you're proud that that's where you come from, and um, and you love America as well. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, just not American foreign policy. It's just currently foreign aid <laughs> or domestic policy for that matter either. But uh, yeah. Um, it seems to be a great part of American culture. That, about. It seems to be a great part of American culture that they are that they have that where they can where they can fly their flag it's you know on their on their lawn right you know they, they people will literally have a flagpole or you know obviously not everybody but that it wouldn't be bizarre like if i installed a a full size flagpole in my front garden and started flying a tricolor it would be seen as being a str and you know i don't think people might not judge me but they certainly think it was a bit weird a bit unusual Ah, yeah. Well, people are people are you used to me being unusual, so they. <laughs> I don't think anyone was surprised when, when when the the flag went up in my my front yard. But yes, it is. It's something I've noticed in a few trips that I've been to the United States, and I have been on quite a few over the decades. Um, is that the flag is very visible and a sense of um, identifying with. The flag um, and identifying with who they are is is or at least was or is it now becoming more is that is is because the first of all they decided the Confederate flag which nobody uh, no everybody in Ireland uh, what you, you know yourself from from Cork matches it used to be uh, waved as uh, because red and white being the Cork colours uh, and the rebel county is and that's what it meant it meant like being the rebel spirit and whatever and then somebody yeah. came along and said no that's racist because of and they went through the detailed paragraphs of history in order to prove that it was racist and now yeah. now you can't wave it and then and then they now they're they're tearing down statues to Thomas Jefferson and George Washington because they were slave owners and you're going well wait wait a minute that's not the whole of the story here and the the the, the, the stars and stripes now are, are becoming offensive to whole groups of of people who are ostensibly American. It's 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 just, it, it's disgusting to see, to be honest. It's disgusting yeah. to see. I I remember going to America years ago and the flag was everywhere. And and nobody um I, and I didn't suddenly go there, oh wait, there's an American flag outside his house. So he must be right wing, uh, the person who lives in there, or he must have a particular political opinion. Um no it it, it it didn't, it meant he was an American and I was in America, so I was surprised to see them there. That's what you would expect. In, Irish, in Ireland, yeah, why well, did you see an Irish flag? Yeah, it's an Irish person who lives in that house. Yeah, that's what you would expect. Uh, if I go to uh, Nigeria and I see a Nigerian flag flying outside somebody's house, I don't knock on his door and go, that's very racist of you. Uh, what's caught? Uh, why won't you put up a, a, a tricolor? And for that matter, a Confederate flag along with it as well, uh, just to be inclusive. I mean, that's an absurdity. Again, it's yeah. an absurdity of the modern world that we insist that there is one code of behavior and one code of identity. And every single person, in ironically, the name of diversity, everybody must be the same. It reminds me of the scene in the life of Brian where... where um, 
where he tries to tell them they're all individuals and they all as a chorus back to him they go we are all individuals <laughs> and that's that's part of diversity <laughs> for you they, 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 they want they say they want diversity but they but the only way to be diverse is if everybody is the same i mean yeah seriously like you it's know, bizarre difference is good Difference yeah. is good and a continuing existence of difference is good. And to travel to the United States and see a culture like, uh, like that there and to, uh, for Americans to travel here and see our culture and for me to go to France uh, and not be mugged or have my car burnt or be beat to death in the street <laughs> and see French culture as I... I did when I used to go to, I have made several trips to France over the course of my life. Not recently, mind you, thank God. But, um, and, and that's, the French were French in France. The Germans are German in Germany, the Italians, that's diversity. That's true diversity. Uh, what's got mm -hmm. the Nigerians, Niger, uh, uh, Nigerian in Nigeria, the Libyans, Libyan in Libya, etc., etc. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's diversity. That's true diversity. Not this kind of McDonaldization slop of diversity, which is in fact uh, um, monochrome sameness, a grey, dull world in which everybody must conform to the exact same rules in order to be diverse. <laughs> you see no diversity in in uh, in the political program that's proposed by people who are in favor of diversity and the people who are in favor of tolerance by the way are the most intolerant people in the world the hate bill act is being produced in ireland now with the purpose of suppressing uh hate in order to expand tolerance and if you're not tolerant enough you, we will put you in jail for being intolerant <laughs> <laughs> like uniformed men will come to your door and drag you into a police van because you weren't tolerant enough of somebody else's opinion yeah 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 and your yes. uh, because your opinion is is deemed intolerant by those who are the arbiters of tolerance it's you know it's it's a crazy it, diversity doesn't mean diversity it means m monochrome uh, sameness uh, um, tolerance doesn't mean tolerance it means intolerance of the any opinion other than the establishment political opinion um we need to we 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 um we have a lot to change in this country and we have a lot of work to do and we do need people to help us and as i say starting point join the party at the uh, on the website you will be contacted there will be a follow-up uh, the follow-up will involve discussing with you how active you want to be uh, right up to um right up to walking up the gallows steps at one point uh, what's got like the manchester martyrs if you if you uh if, if you're if you're willing to go that far um i hope it won't come to that but you know I don't draw a line on what, on what I'm willing to do for Ireland, and I don't think many national party people do. Brilliant. Great. Well, thanks again, Justin. Um, it's now 10 to, 10 to 11, so uh, we're going to call it call it an end. Thanks to everybody who came along. Obviously, I've, I've linked it a few times in the chat, but everyone get over to nationalparty.ie uh, forward slash join if you want to join up. Um yeah obviously like subscribe um everything else this has been a great chat i've really enjoyed it. hopefully i'll be able to have you on sometime in the future if you're interested um because i've really enjoyed it and i've actually learned yeah i've learned quite a lot and especially engaging with your with the other interview i was listening to today i've you know, got a better feel for the kind of the flavor of irish history that maybe i didn't quite grasp before so i really have enjoyed that um, and I'm glad I, I I'm glad I gave you something new to think about. That was a uh, that was good for me, you know, to be able to come up with something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely, uh... I will remember that. <laughs> I will remember that. Um, so thank you very much for having me on, and uh, and we will see each other again. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to end the broadcast. <laughs>